Good evening, everyone. That was Easter Fantasy on Ancient Hymns for Brass Quintet and Organ by Sandra K. Tucker. For those of you who are keeping score of the musical selections at the Job Study. We welcome everyone uh, who's here tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Job 1 through 18 tonight. We're going to kind of take tonight as a little bit of a uh, review. Uh, and so uh, we'll uh, uh, pick up some themes that we've been uh, talking about and uh, and go from there. Uh, remember, I'll pause from time to time for questions. Uh, there is about a 20-second delay uh, from the time that I speak here in my office to the time you hear me, because apparently it takes 20 seconds to go to outer space and back. So uh, we'll give a little bit of a time there for people to uh, to people to ask questions. But I encourage you to, when you have a question, jot it down. Uh, so when I call for them, you're ready to type. Okay, uh, let's begin with prayer. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks uh, this evening for gathering us together around your word, around the book of Job. We ask you, Lord, to open our hearts and our minds so that you may speak to us and we may hear you. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. All right. So uh, we are uh, in Job, uh, and we've covered 1 through 18. Uh, 19 is a pivotal chapter, and so I want to take a little bit of time to review 1 through 18 tonight before we go move into 19 uh, next week. Uh, so to recap. Job is uh, devastated by Satan. Uh, Satan goes into the throne room of heaven and uh, tells God that the only reason that Job worships him is because God gives him everything. He's a spoiled, rotten child. And of course he would uh, be righteous and holy and perfect because uh, God gives him everything. And so God says, all right, you can take away his stuff, but don't touch his people and uh, don't touch him. And so Satan took away all the stuff, and God, uh, Job continued to worship God, and continued to be faithful to God. And uh, Job said, well, the only reason that he's still faithful to you is because you didn't let me touch his people or, or him. And so then, uh, then God says, okay, you can touch his people, but, uh, and you can touch him, but you can't kill him. And so then Satan uh, uh, devastates all of his children. Uh, all the children are dead. His wife turns against him. Uh, his, he's basically emotionally abandoned by his wife, curse God and die, she says in Job nine, uh, Job 2.9. Uh, and uh, he's lost his health. He's covered in boils uh, from uh, head to toe. And he's sitting in the dirt. And he has no children anymore. He has no money. He has no possessions. And in those days, money and possessions were sort of the same thing because uh, your, your money was all tied up in your land and your animals. And uh, Job is sitting there in the dirt, uh, bemoaning his fate. Job believes firmly that everything that happens to you, including suffering, is the will of God. Okay? That's not an unusual belief. Uh, we see that same belief surface time and time again today. Uh, people believe, there are people who believe that everything that happens to you, including suffering, is the will of God. And we've talked uh, before in this class, I think last week or the week before, uh, we talked about the fact that we have to always separate will and foreknowledge. Uh, it is the foreknowledge of God. God knows everything. And I remember last week I said, uh, you know, that uh, from, from C.S. Lewis, you know, if this is your life, this, this uh, piece of paper, uh, you, you see, um, you know, from point A to point B, this line, you know, you see this line, God sees the whole page. So, yes, God knows everything, he sees everything, uh, but it does not mean under any conditions that he wills everything. God's will and his foreknowledge are two different things, but that's not what Job believes. So, if you're like Job, and you believe that everything that happens, including suffering, is the will of God, uh, if that's so, then Job's got to ask, why has God chosen to make him suffer? And there's really only one of two answers to that. Uh, either uh, Job has missed an offering for an atoning sacrifice, he has uh, sinned somehow, and he has neglected to make the appropriate sacrifice to pay for that sin, and God's punishing him, or God is unjust. Okay? That's th those are the only two answers. This was a, a common thread of thought, uh, particularly among uh, German Lutherans, 
in, uh, in, in prior to World War II. Uh, there, there were many, uh, particularly um, uh, Norwegian and, and uh, Swedish uh, and Danish Lutherans. It was a particular line of thought there. Most of the, uh, or a great deal of the pietism in the Lutheran church, and remember we, we've, we've talked about pietism in my other Bible studies, uh, you know, uh, pietism, piety is a good thing. Uh, piety means trying to live your life uh, according to the Ten Commandments, according to the moral law. Uh, that's a good thing, to be pious. Pietism is the belief that somehow your works of good elevate you, you know, uh, in some way. Uh, elevate you in the eyes of God, uh, and the eyes of man too, obviously, but, but the eyes of God. Uh, and so most of Lutheran pietism comes from Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish roots. That's where the, that's where, and, and, and some West German. That's where a lot of the pietism comes from. So it was a very common thought, even up into World War II, uh, that if you lived a good life, you would be rewarded. And this is why uh, some of the German Lutherans had such a, and, and, and the uh, Scandinavian Lutherans, had such a hard time believing uh, that Hitler uh, could do the things he, he could do. And did the things he did is they were living a good life. They were they were doing their best. They were worshiping God. They were doing everything they're supposed to do as good Lutherans. And Panzer tanks are rolling into their town. Uh, and so a goodly number of uh, of Lutherans uh, walked away from their faith uh, because of World War II. Not to mention a goodly number of Jews as well who also believed the same thing. The, 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 that that line of piety runs through Judaism as well. Is that if you do the right things, if you act the right way, God will reward you. If you don't, God will punish you. And the uh, one of the the key places for seeing that so clearly is in the uh, in the play Fiddler on the Roof. And if you listen to Tevye's uh, you know, mo uh, monologues with God, um, diatribes, I guess with God, um, so often you know Tevye is angry with God because Tevye has done everything he's supposed to do and things aren't working out the way they're supposed to work out. Uh, so this is, not a, this is not a new thing, this idea that, that God rewards you uh, if, if you do the right thing and punishes you if you don't. Even today, I'll, I, I run into people all the time who, who, are, who are facing tragedy and hardship in their lives and they'll say, Pastor, you know, I've, I've done everything right. I've, I've raised my kids in the church. I've prayed. I've given an offering. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I don't understand why this is happening to me. Uh, and, and it's that same line of thought that if I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, then God will reward me. And if, if I'm not being rewarded, either I've missed something and I, I failed somewhere that, I, that, I, that I'm not aware of, or God is unjust. And that's the thing that causes people to walk away from faith is this belief that God is unjust. Uh, I would suggest that that might be um, one of Satan's uh, really good tools. Because if he can get us to believe that God is an unjust pu puppeteer who's just making mockery of our lives, uh, and, and, and we understand that God is all-powerful so we can't win, uh, then th I could understand why people would walk away. Why would you want to be part of a religion uh, with that kind of capricious, whimsical God uh, toying with your life, okay? Um, Job's friends come then to, to comfort him uh, in chapter 3, and they are absolutely of no help whatsoever uh, because they too agree with Job that everything that happens is according to God's will. Um, th they um, chide Job uh, because they suggest that Job is suggesting that he knows more than God. You know, when Job keeps saying, this is not right, uh, I haven't done anything, I don't deserve this. And, of course, they, they, uh, they suggest, uh, the three friends, that, of course, Job must have done something wrong. Or, uh, with Bildad, uh, he suggests that uh, Job's children must have done something wrong. And Job forgot to, to mediate for a sin, uh, to, to have a sin atoned for. Uh, for one of his kids. This brings Job to the point uh, in Job uh, 9. And if you want to look that up, I'm going to look at Job 9, verse 32, particularly. Okay, beginning at verse, Job 9, beginning at verse 32. 
uh, Job says, For he is not a man as I am, that I might answer him, that we should come to trial together. Okay? See, Job has no problem. He has no problem going to trial here. Because he, he feels like he's done everything, uh, he thinks he's done everything that he can. So if he thinks he's, he's done everything he can, and God is still punishing him, all right, let's go to court, okay? Which was a very common thing in those days, you know? I mean, it was uh, when you had a problem uh, in, in, the, uh, in the village, uh, you gathered uh, three elders together, uh, older men of the village who were uh, wiser and had some life experience, and you would go lay your charge out before these three men, and then they would make a decision for you. They didn't. Uh, we we didn't have the lengthy um, judicial system that we have today. Remember, I, you've heard me say it many times. Uh, what we have is a legal system, not a justice system. Uh, it, it's not necessarily justice that is doled out in our courts. It's legalities, and uh, very often the person who's wealthy enough to to hire the most lawyers wins. Uh, or or the best lawyers wins. Uh, very very seldom, sadly, does it have much to do with who's right and who's wrong. It who who knows how to work the system best is who wins. Uh, it's a very sad system, but it is what we what it is. Uh, and these days, uh, the the goal was justice. It was swift. Uh, three wiser, unattached men, men who are not attached to the to either party in the in the dispute, uh, would listen to the evidence and would make a decision, and it would be handled. Okay, so this is what Job wants. He says, "Look, I'm willing to go to court here." Uh, he says, uh, "But you're not a man as I am." That's what he says to God. He says, "You're not a man like I, that, that that we can go to trial together." Then verse thirty three, he says, "There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both." Uh, and you can see there the picture of the older, wiser uh, judge, uh, elder of the village, you know, uh, putting a, a hand on each, a hand on each sh uh, shoulder. Uh, one on of the accused and the accuser and saying, uh, you know, look, boys, this is how it is. You know, you're wrong here. You're wrong here. Uh, this is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to do. And this is how we're going to fix it. OK, uh, that's but, but he says, who can do that? Who can lay, who can lay a hand on both of us and, and say that? And then he says in verse 34, uh, let him take his rod away from me. Talking about God, let God take his rod away from me and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak without fear of him, for I am not so in myself. Uh, he, he, how do you how do you criticize God? You know, uh, this is uh, Job is very aware of how powerful God is. Um, so what Job needs is a mediator who can fully understand him as a man. You know, he doesn't believe that God can really understand him as a man, uh, and in fact, can he? You know, can God, being only the Father, ever really understand what it is to be man? And you could make the argument uh, that he's the creator and he created the machine, so he knows how it works. Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose that there's an element of truth there. But even God himself uh, determined that he, would, that he needed something else. He needed something more, uh, which is why he became man. That's the miracle of the incarnation that we're going to talk about in a little bit here. But, the, the, you know, the miracle of the incarnation is that God said, yeah, you do need an arbiter, uh, an arbiter in Job's words um, that uh, that could lay his hand on both of us. OK, um, a mediator who can fully understand being man and yet still fully be God. And of course, that is exactly Jesus. And it's why uh, this is why why Job is such an important text or important book for the New Testament. And it's why the, the, the Job is quoted several times in, in the New Testament, because it is such an important book uh, for understanding Christ, uh, the, understanding the, the, the quandary that human beings were in, uh, having this judge that is the Almighty God, uh, who says very clearly in Leviticus 19.2, be holy as I am holy. That's the, that's the standard. Not try your best. Not uh, you know, not do all you can, and I'll do the rest. That's not what he says. That's what not what he ever says. Uh, some people like to uh, to separate the Old Testament God from the New Testament God and say, "Well, that was the Old Testament." Uh, there, I that's one. Most of the times, I don't like liberals, but um, you know, but one of the things the liberals really get right here 
is where they they have stopped using the term Old Testament and New Testament and use the terms First Testament and Second Testament uh, because it makes it makes it a lot more clear that the First Testament and the Second Testament go together as a unit to, to form the full Word of God, the full Torah, the full Scripture. Okay, uh, so uh, the, the Old Testament people lived under this quandary of saying, "We have to be holy." The New Testament people had Jesus. You know, now there's the answer all right, that we we can be holy. We are holy. When God says, uh, "Be holy," you can say with absolute conviction, and you're absolutely right. I am holy. You are fully sanctified. That's what sanctification means, right? Made holy. That's what the word means. Uh, you are fully made holy. Uh, and then there's the whole uh, the whole struggle of what Luther called simul justus epicator, uh, Latin for simultaneously saint and sinner. Because while we are fully holy, we also have a fallen nature that, that is constantly popping up and causing us problems. Okay, That's why you still have temptation. Uh, it's why you will have temptation until the day you die. Uh, I, I love asking uh, uh, really old people, uh, about temptation, because it's always fun to get their perspective uh, f- uh, of what temptation is and isn't. And uh, I, I always think of Dorothy Deverman. She was one of my favorites, um, because you could have, uh, I could have theological discussions with Dorothy um, right up until her death. I mean, she was mentally right on point, uh, right to her death. And uh, when she was about 96 or 97, I asked her, I said, do you, do you still struggle with temptation? And she just rolled her eyes and said, oh, pastor. It, it's just, you know, it always, it was always with her, even to the, even to that long, it never stops. Uh, in fact, there's some argument for temptation getting worse uh, the older you are, because the longer Satan has to work with you, the more pointed he can get in his temptations. So he doesn't waste time throwing things in your path that don't tempt you. Uh, you know, if you're if you're not tempted by something, he doesn't. He knows by the time you're, you know, I don't, probably much younger than ninety seven. He already knows what tempts you and what doesn't, and doesn't bother throwing the things that that don't tempt you at you. That's why it's so easy to be judgmental of people. Yeah, you know, when people are tempted by something that doesn't tempt us, it's very easy to be judgmental and to say, "Oh, I don't understand how." You know that person can call himself Christian and do this or say that. Uh, well, it's not your temptation. You know that, that's uh, like I've said many times in, in Bible class. Uh, you know a a, a bottle of uh, scotch can last in my house for a year. Alcohol doesn't tempt me. This has never been a temptation for me. I'll drink it once in a while. It's not, it's 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 nice. It's a nice drink. Uh, it's not a temptation for me. But put out a, a pan of uh, double fudge brownies, uh, and that's all I think about. Um, I, I literally think about them constantly until they're gone, which is why I don't want them in my house because I do not need to eat double fudge brownies. Uh, but that's that's my temptation. Food is my thing. Uh, it's just what tempts me. Uh, so so I would be very uh, remiss in being judgmental of somebody who's tempted by alcohol when I know that my temptation is just as great uh, with sugar. Um is it may not be as, as harmful to me, or maybe it is. Maybe it's more harmful to me. I don't know. Uh, Doc Boudreaux would probably say it's more harmful to me. Uh, but it's it's not a it's not a societal evil like alcoholism. Uh, being obese is a, not a societal evil, so our society doesn't judge it as harshly as alcoholism. But really, it's very it's a very similar thing. Uh, whatever the temptation is, it is what it is, and usually uh, Satan only tempts us to do things that are going to be going to harm us physically and or spiritually. Uh, if he if he can uh, uh, get both, that's a you know that's a twofer for him. If he can do something that harms us physically and spiritually, that's that's all the better. Uh, so Job loses his patience with his friends. And that's one of my uh, my favorite parts. I should dress up like a brownie. Not not the Girl Scouts. That's not what I'm not those are not the brownies that tempt me, Danya. Uh, Danya says she should dress up like a brownie. No, please don't. Uh, I don't even want to, now you've got an image in my head. Um, so Job uh, 16 is where I'm going next. I want to look at Job 16 when he finally runs out of patience with his friends. Okay. Um, 
Job, uh, when he finally runs out of his patience with his friends, Job answered and said, this is in Job 16, 1 through 6, I have heard many such things, miserable comforters are you all. Shall windy words have an end, or what provokes you that you answer? I could, I could all, I also could speak as you do, if you were in my place. I could join words together against you and shake my head at you. I could strengthen you with my mouth and solace of my lips would assage your pain. Um, so he, he's he's uh, he's had enough. Uh, the friends have uh, said all that Job really wants to hear from them at this point, and I don't blame them because they have been of precious little comfort to him at all. But then he turns on God in chapter, in verse seven. So chapter 16, verse seven, he says, surely now God has worn me out. He has made desolate all my company. He has shriveled me up, which is a witness against me. And my leanness has risen up against me. It testifies to my face. He has torn me in his wrath and hated me. He has gnashed his teeth at me. My adversary sharpens his eyes against me. Men have gaped at me with their mouth. They have struck me insolently on the cheek. They mass themselves together against me. God gives me up to the ungodly and casts me into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease and he broke me apart. He seized me by the neck and dashed me to pieces. He set me up as his target. His archers surround me. He slashes open my kidneys and does not spare. He pours out my gall on the ground. He breaks me with breach upon breach. He runs upon me like a warrior. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask in just a minute if you have questions. So uh, so be thinking about that. Uh, as soon as I get through these next couple of points here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up for questions. Uh, Job says uh, basically three charges against God here. Uh, God has torn him, uh, hated him, and turned him over to evil adversaries. Okay, that, That's what Job says. God has torn him, hated him, and turned him over to evil adversaries. And then in verse 12, he sort of sums it all up, says, he dashed me to pieces. Um, what I want you to think about is, I mean, that's clearly a charge against God, right? I mean, that is, he is laying it out there and he's saying, God, this is what you did to me uh, for no good reason. Did Job, who knew nothing of the conversation between God and Satan, okay, remember he knows nothing about what we know uh, in chapters uh, one and two. He didn't know that. Did Job sin by charging God this way? Did, God, did Job sin by charging God this way? So I'll open it up to questions now, and I know there's a 20 second delay, so I'll give people 20 seconds. Okay, we've had about uh, 30 seconds here, and I don't see any questions coming through. Did Job sin by charging God? That's the question. Uh, or anything else that you've... Yeah, Dave, Dave uh, Breschuk uh, suggests no. Uh, Rosalie's not sure she understands. Yeah, me either. Um, I'm not sure I understand any of this. Uh, yeah, did Job sin by charging God? Well, let's ask this question. Um, yeah, Vicky says that he, she thinks that, that he's saying what God has done. He was angry. Yeah, Dave says he was angry. Uh, um, you know, did Job sin by charging God this way? By saying, you've, you've uh, 
hated me, turned me over to evil adversaries, torn me, dashed me to pieces. Uh, the, the consensus so far is no, that that was not a sin. Uh, it, it is a yes, because God cannot sin. Um, yeah, if, if you view it as though God is capricious and sinful, if God is acting unjust, uh, then he's not God. Okay, God cannot be unjust. That's one of the things God can't be. God cannot be unloving. God cannot be untruthful. You know, he can't do it. Um, yeah, he's not denouncing God, right? Rosalie says that he's not denouncing God. No, I, and this is, this is a, a, a point I want to ask. You know, think about this. Is it a sin to doubt God? Okay. Or is it just our natural weakness as human beings struggling, uh, being finite to comprehend the infinite? Uh, that that's the that's the difficult uh, task here, um, is that is that we are in a position with Job uh, to 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 comprehend something that is really quite incomprehensible. Um, Job is accusing God of being unjust. Well, I mean that's really that's the that's the option, right? Is either what what Job wants to know is either. I've done something that I've missed that you and you're not telling me. Uh, so I, I've committed some kind of sin and you're not telling me what I did. So how can I atone for it? Because remember, uh, under the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, um, you know, you, you, you commit sin. Everybody commits sin, but you have a list of, of things to do, of, you know, pigeons or goats or sheep or grain or whatever uh, to offer. Uh, as a sacrifice in order to atone for that sin. And that's the sacrificial system that God has put into place. Now, it's not fully into place yet because we're before Leviticus at this point. So, so chronologically, we're quite some time before, before Leviticus. But there was still a fairly clear sacrificial system. If, if you look back at Genesis um, with Abraham, you know, Abraham made sacrifices to God for various things. So Job thinks, as far as he can tell, He's made all the correct sacrifices, and yet he's still suffering this horrible, this horrible, these horrible things. So what he's saying to God is, "Look, you've broken me, you've beaten me, you've trampled me, you've dashed me to pieces. I don't know what to do." Okay, and then, and you know, what I'm asking is, uh, you know, and I think Joan said, "Yeah, it's weakness. Um, it's it's human weakness to to comprehend the infinite." And it's interesting to see how God responds to Job. We're going to jump way ahead here. Uh, to, to one of God's responses. This is some of the best part of Job, but we're going to take a little peek here at chapter 40. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Job 40, and uh, let's look at uh, verse 7. Uh, chapter 40, verse 7. And God says, Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? So God doesn't, you know, say he's wrong or sinful. Um, he basically, he says, buck up, you know. I'm going to I'm going to ask ask you some questions here. You want to have a talk? We'll have a talk. Okay? Uh he he really is going to bolster Job. Uh in in 40 um like a POW that survives and says they never gave up hope because of God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's Job Job probably has there's a lot of uh of um interplay uh between Job and people who have suffered various kinds of prisoners of war kind of thing. Uh, contend, wrestle with God, therefore it's not sinful to doubt God's will. Right. Uh, not, it, it, is it, it's not sinful to doubt God's will. That's an interesting way to put it. Um, I think it is sinful to doubt God's will, uh, but not sinful to, to doubt um, if God is, uh, is out there, if God's paying attention, if God's 
Uh, it's not sinful to, to doubt God. Okay, and I'll tell you a story about that. Um, I had a little girl uh, in confirmation one time um, who says uh, who, who said to a, uh, a, a Sunday school teacher, sometimes I doubt God. And uh, the Sunday school teacher sort of flippantly replied to her, well, then you should go find another church because we don't doubt God here. Okay, which is a which is a uh, kind of a uh, a pietistic Lutheran answer. Um, a, a a person who has never had doubts about their faith um, at any time in their lives probably hasn't uh, really considered their faith too seriously. Because uh, I don't know of a person, I don't know of a Christian. Uh, who at some point in their lives didn't have some level of doubt. Um, and so, and she wanted to know, she said, sometimes I, I doubt God, is that a sin? Um, and what I told her was, uh, as I said, um, well, do you ever have doubts about the monster in your closet? And she was about 13 or 14 years old at this time. And, and she looked at me, she rolled her eyes. She said, pastor, I don't believe there's a monster in my closet. I'm not a little kid. I said, oh, okay. I said, do you ever uh, do you ever have doubts about the boogeyman hiding under your bed? And she rolled her eyes again. And she said, Pastor, I'm not a little kid. I don't believe in boogeymen. And I said, exactly. You don't doubt them because you don't believe in them. If you doubt God, if you doubt that God's paying attention, or you doubt that God is uh, treating you in a way he should treat you, that's a sign of faith. No, that's not a sign of, that's not a sin. It's a sign of faith. It's a, it's, it's wrestling with God. And actually God calls us to wrestle with him. Uh, look at the story of Jacob, you know, wrestling with God until dawn, until God apparently grew tired of it and threw his hip out of joint and said, okay, enough of that. Okay. Uh, God encourages us to wrestle with him, to try to understand him. Uh, when, when, when Job, when I read this, uh, the section from Job 47 through 9, uh, what God is saying is he's not condemning Job for doubting, but he's rather, rather he's saying, okay, if you want to go, let's go. Okay. You want to talk? Here I am. We're going to talk. And God responds, and we're going to get to that later on uh, throughout Job uh, 40 and uh, 39 and 40, uh, where God really lays it on the line for Job. And it's one of my favorite parts of the Bible. Uh, where God says who he is and what he does and gives Job great comfort uh, in, in knowing that God is in control of all things, okay? Uh, Job did not think uh, that he was ever going to see justice. He, he really didn't have any hope that, that he would ever see justice. I'm going back here in a minute to Job 16. Um, he, uh, he prayed that his... Uh, Listen to this, Job 16, 18. He prayed, O earth, cover not my blood and let my cry find no resting place. Okay? O earth, cover not my blood and let my cry find no resting place. Um, what I want you to think about is, what does that remind you of? Earth, cover not my blood and let my cry find no resting place. Uh, it, the, 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 the blood of the earth crying out to God. What does that remind you of? Anybody? What does that cry? The earth crying out to God. The blood and the earth crying out to God. What does that remind you of? Jesus' death, okay? Uh, not where I was. Doesn't Israel mean to contend? Yeah, yeah, exactly, Frank. Uh, Israel, that's exactly true. Israel means the one who, one who contends with God. Yeah, uh, that's uh, which God encouraged uh, Jacob to do. Jacob, of course, means deceiver. And, uh, and then he changed his name to Israel, one who contends with God. Aaron, yes, Cain and Abel, exactly. Uh, that's the earth crying out. Re, uh, if you look at Genesis 4, uh, verse, uh, where am I? Genesis four, verse 10. 
And the Lord said to Cain, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Um, this line from Job, O earth, cover not my blood, and let my cry find no resting place, makes me wonder uh, if Job knew the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, very well could have. Remember, it's it's uh, nothing's written down at this point. It's all oral tradition, you know, handed down from father to son, father to son, uh, the stories of, of God. But the way Job puts that makes me think of Cain and Abel. Uh, and Cain and Abel is a great uh, example of, of, uh, of how creation and creator are, are intricately bound together. Um, the, the, the blood cries out from the earth to God. God feels uh, the pain of one unjustly burdened, okay? And God will make it just. That's, that's the story of Cain and Abel, that God feels the pain of one who's, who, is, who has suffered injustice. And really, you know, that's, that's gospel for us as Christians, knowing that that every injustice that we experience in this life will be handled by God, okay? by God. Maybe not in our time. We may not ever get to see it. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily for us to see. Uh, it's not necessarily, in, you know, according to our timeline, that when we would, we would like it to happen. Um, it's, and it's, it's certainly not necessarily the way we think it should happen always, right? Uh, but nevertheless, Job knows that God will uh, see his injustice resolved, okay? Uh, he did not understand why he suffered. Up until, uh, up until we're at chapter 18, he has not understood why he suffered. Um, but his confidence in his, is in God's ultimate justice, okay? and that's how he endured, is his absolute confidence in God's ultimate justice. He says in 16, uh, beginning at verse 19, Job 16, beginning at verse 19, even now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and he who testifies for me is on high. My friends scorn me. My eye pours out tears to God that he would argue the case of man with God as a son of man does with his neighbor. For when a few years have come, I shall go the way from which I shall not return. Okay. Uh, he knows, uh, he doesn't think that he's going to see justice, but he knows that ultimate justice will happen, and that's how he endures. All right. Uh, Jesus, of course, we've talked about last week, is Job's witness. Uh, let's look at Hebrews. Uh, let's see. Let's look at Hebrews uh, 2, cha Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at four, verse uh, 14. Hebrews 2, beginning at verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay, Jesus is Job's witness. Uh, Jesus approaches the judge of the universe to show his perfect, obedient life fulfilled his law. God demands that his law be fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled it. Hey, always remember that. God doesn't forgive you because, you know, he's a happy grandpa in heaven bouncing you on his knee and you're just so wonderful he just can't bear to punish you. God has no choice but to punish you. He must punish you for sin. That's what justice means. You break the rules, you get punished. 
God forgives you because Jesus paid the price. Jesus, by his perfect obedience, fulfilled God's law for us. Uh, number two, uh, Hebrews, back to Hebrews, he uses his high position to speak for us. He intercedes for us. Uh, that's why we can take such, um, we, can, we can be so calm in the face of uh, hysteria. That's why Christians don't have to get hysterical over the silly virus. Okay? We know who's in charge, and we know who is speaking for us. Okay? Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, is before the throne of God speaking for us, interceding for us. Okay? Uh, and, and anyone who would think, well, yeah, but God doesn't understand. Okay? Because again, you know, we see this one little line, God sees the whole page. God can't understand. Yeah, I know God knows what's going to happen with this virus and with everything else. And uh, of course, you know, now now people are the new panic. We've, we've gotten through toilet paper. Now the new panic is running out of food. OK, well, from the size of most Americans, we could do without food for a little while. But that's beside the point. The point is, is that are we going to be fearful and panic over that? Yeah. Why? God already knows what's going on. Jesus is already interceding for us. He's already interceding for us to the Father saying, hey, this is what they need. And does and, and, and before we say, yeah, but God doesn't understand, does Jesus know what it is to be hungry? Absolutely. Yeah. 40 days in the wilderness with no food. First, tempta first temptation the devil threw at him. Hey, turn these stones into bread. You can do it, right? If you're God. Could he turn those stones into bread? Absolutely. He sure could have. Wouldn't have been any problem at all. He didn't. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows Garden of Gethsemane. Okay? You don't sweat blood because you're calm and, and, and happy, having a happy time. You know, Jesus was, humanly speaking, terrified of what he was going to have to go through. The least of which was being uh, beaten half to death and nailed to a cross. That wasn't, that wasn't nearly what terrified him. What terrified him was facing hell. Something that, uh, that God uh, had never done. God can't go to hell. But the Son of God, fully human, can. Okay? He hears and feels our weeping, our fear, our sorrow, and he pleads to God for us. That is who is kneeling before God for us, is our intercessor, our mediator. And the interesting thing about it, the, 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 maybe the, the, the best thing about it, is that he does all of this not because he's our paid attorney. Okay? You pay an attorney to do things for you. Um, you don't really, uh, you, you know that the attorney is doing whatever he's doing or she's doing because she gets paycheck out of it. Jesus does it. Because he's our brother, because we are related to him. I think that's a different a different model, you know, for us to consider. That um, that sometimes we don't really think about. Um, I think most people understand that we will do things for family that we wouldn't do for anybody else. Uh, we'll put up with things for family that we wouldn't put up with from anybody else. Uh, there's something about being family uh, that that makes a difference. And the closer that family bond is, the more that's true. Um, you know, and you can you can start with your uh, your spouse and your children and your parents and your siblings and your your church family, and you can just go out and out and out for it. <coughs> Excuse me, and you can see how often uh, it is that that we'll we will bend over backwards for family. That's why Jesus does what he does for us, because we're his brothers and sisters. Okay, so that's why he does what he does, not because he's some kind of paid attorney that's, that's uh, getting a fee. You need uh, to know and to remember and to tell others uh, that Jesus is pleading his, your case before God all the time. Okay? Pleading it to God with whom he is one, Right? Because in a way that we don't really understand, the Father and the Son are one God. Okay. Now, knowing that, 
knowing that, that Jesus is your brother and he's pleading your case moment by moment before his father in heaven, think about how that might affect the way you pray. Okay, think about the way that might affect the way you pray. And I'm looking for comments here. Probably shouldn't be complaining so much then. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Pray for the good of all instead of for ourselves. Okay. Think about the way you pray. How does it affect the way you pray uh, by knowing that Jesus, your brother, is pleading your case before God the Father? Greater expression of gratitude, which is yeah, sort of similar to what Sarah said about not you know less complaining, uh, more gratitude. I just got a text from Matt, but I couldn't read it. It went, it went away too fast uh, because I've, I'm using my phone to tape the Bible study, so it's hard for me to look at texts, too. Uh, but I can answer it later, Matt, if I, if I uh, get when I, after the class. Thankful for the intercessor. Yeah. Yeah, you know, what I'm, what I'm hearing here is sort of a um, the general kind of tone is, Maybe too much, dear God, give me, dear God, give me this, dear God, give me that. Uh, if let's see, but we should probably pray if, as if we're talking to a family member and not afraid to tell a family member the whole truth. Yeah, yeah, shouldn't be afraid to ask anything. Well, that's definitely true. Yeah, you should always be uh, willing to, to ask anything. Um, be more honest with God about your prayers. Yeah. My brothers would have never, I'm not getting that full comment from Bob there. My brothers would have never something. Let's see if I can see it here. Uh, gone, my brothers would have never gone to my dad to help me. <laughs> yeah, my brothers probably would have just stabbed me in the back. But uh, we can talk to God like he's our brother, say anything we want, share everything. Yeah, you know, that. The um, sometimes prayers uh, can tend to be um, a little bit like, uh, oh, oh, God, um, I'm a poor worm and I don't deserve anything. And I'm so sorry for blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, I understand that you're you're punishing me for this reason or that reason. Um, but this is our family. You know, this is this is our brother Jesus, uh, who's taking these prayers to his father for us. Uh, so yeah, uh, total honesty, uh, and maybe, uh, and I think that the general consensus is maybe get outside yourself a little bit, uh, and realize that uh, Jesus is he's he's got you. You know, he's he's got you taken care of. Uh, Jesus was human and can be uh, that good arbiter. Yeah. Jesus knows what you need. I love that part in Romans where Paul talks about the Holy Spirit uh, praying for us with groans uh, that uh, 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 words can't even express. You know, when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit's praying for us with groans that words cannot express. Uh, similar with, with the idea of Jesus standing before the Father saying, look, uh, 
look, uh, Father, the, I know this is what they're saying, but this is what they mean. Okay? Uh, he, Jesus is interpreting for us, telling God what we need, uh, even when we don't really understand what we need. Uh, so, you know, prayers like, dear God, help me win the lottery, uh, that's sort of a trivial prayer. Uh, prayers like, dear God, help me be a better steward with all the gifts you've given me, uh, seems to make a little bit more sense, uh, knowing the status that we have. Um, you know, we're the royal family. Uh, we're, we're not some poor uh, worm on the street. Uh, we're, we, we're, we're the royal family. And so what we have is we have our brother Jesus going before the king, uh, pleading our case for us. I think that changes. Uh, I, I think it, uh, w when we realize we're not pleading our case before a hostile judge, um, it's not someone who wants to hurt us. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, a judge who loves us. You know, if you were in court and you were pleading your case in court for whatever it was, and you were before a judge who, who was your brother uh, and who loved you, uh, not like uh, not, not the kind that wants to you know stab you in the back when you have your back turned, but a brother who really loves you uh, and a father who really loves you, uh, you know, you're it's a much more comfortable place to be. Uh, to plead your case in that kind of situation. Uh, I want to cover, I've got about uh, 10 more minutes here. I want to cover uh, one last thing here. Uh, and that's from John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Uh, beginning at, oh, let's start at verse 14. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Okay. Um, that particular that first part, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, the Greek word there that's used for dwelt, is, is translated as dwelt, uh, is literally tabernacled or tented. He tabernacled or tented among us. And for the, uh, for the people of uh, Jesus' day, who heard those words, uh, you know immediately when they hear that he tabernacled among us, what are they going to think of? They're going to think of the Holy of Holies, right? The tabernacle, uh, the place in the Holy of Holies uh, where, the, uh, where the, the Ark of the Covenant, where the Ten Commandments uh, was, were housed, where it was the dwelling place of God. That was the physical dwelling place of God. Uh, now, Jesus, in, this, in his coming, uh, he changes the location of the tabernacle. God, in the Old Testament, literally lived among his people, right? The, 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 the tabernacle was set, and then the, the, the tent of meeting, and then the courtyard, uh, and all of that. If you've seen pictures, you'll go to your, your Bibles and look up in Leviticus, and you'll see pictures of how the, they think the tabernacle was laid out from the, the book of Leviticus. And then the people camped all, you know, all around that. God literally dwelt in the midst of his people. So too does he still literally dwell in the midst of his people in Christ, okay? which is, right, the body of Christ is the church, right? Us. We're the body of Christ. And Jesus literally dwells within us. He tabernacled with us. Um, I think too many times, uh, and this is why we get into such trouble on Facebook uh, with Facebook theology, uh, too, many pe too many times people wrongly see God as dwelling outside of the world. Okay, he he, you know, the world is here and God is up here, and 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 God, you know, inflicts lightning bolts onto the world. Um, understand that any affliction that affects us affects God, because He lives within us, right? 
any affliction that affects us affects God because he lives within us. Uh, that's why I, I, I talk about, um, you know, about you are the dwelling of Christ. So when you choose to, to uh, participate in some kind of sinful behavior, when you choose to run somebody down on Facebook, or when you choose to, to be demeaning towards somebody, or to, make, to mock somebody or to make fun of somebody uh, in a hurtful way, uh, when you choose to do those things, you are tracking garbage into the tabernacle. You know, God's sitting there on the sofa saying, oh, come on, can't you wipe your feet? You know, this is ridiculous. Can't you wipe your feet? Why are you dragging that trash into my house? God dwells there. He lives there. Uh, they do not understand the Holy Spirit that dwells in all Christians. Right, right. They don't. Uh, and, I, and I think that is a fundamental flaw in, in probably a huge number of Christians uh, on this earth is that they, well, the, the fundamental human flaw is that we all uh, shoot our mouth off before we think, right? Uh, it would do everybody good to count to 10 before you touch the keyboard. Um, you know, before you post, before you react, um, you know, social media is the, is the great Satan today. Uh, hasn't always been, it used to be other things. Uh, you know, when I was, uh, when I was a kid in seminary, the professors always taught us, uh, because that was before email. I know it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, that, that, that I'm that old. But, uh, but the professors always taught us before we return a letter to a parishioner who's ticked us off, before we send that letter, put it in our desk drawer and let it sit there for two days. Take it out and reread it and make sure we really want to send it. Okay? Uh, unfortunately, email has given us the opportunity and, and, and Facebook is now even more immediate uh, and, and Instagram and Twitter and, you know, I mean, Twitter should just be taken away from everybody. You know, that you shouldn't, tw tweeting is, is dangerous to Christians. Um, Danya needs to count to 30. Okay, yeah, probably, so it wouldn't be bad. You're from Texas. Uh, so it, it would be good for you to count to 30. Um, so, you know, immediate feedback is not a good idea. Think, think before you react. Think before you answer. Uh, and realize, remember who dwells in you. That, that when, you, when you make that demeaning comment, when you mock, uh, when you mock that uh, public figure, uh, I mean, Lord knows that, that Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump, you know, set themselves up for all kinds of mocking. I, and Joe Biden, too. I understand they say things uh, that you, know, you, you just have to bite your tongue till it bleeds. Uh, I understand. I, 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 I struggle with the same thing. But openly mocking our elected officials in public is, a, is breaking the fourth commandment. It's, it's just blatantly breaking the fourth commandment. Uh, if you are frustrated with them, do as I do and write them a letter I, or, or an email. I can't tell you how many emails I have sent our president, um, you know, because he has said things that, I, that, that, I'm, that concern me. And so I send him an email. He never answers. I don't know if he sees them or not, but I do what I can, you know, uh, to follow Matthew 18, which is, uh, says, if you have something against your brother, deal with him privately, okay, privately first. And so making mockery of him on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram is not the way to handle disagreements uh, with our elected officials of any ilk, uh, whether it's uh, uh, Governor Pritzker or President Trump or Speaker Pelosi or whoever it is. Um, remember, when you do that, you're dragging God into that because he lives within you. Uh, God also, by the way, is always for you, Okay. Even when you're suffering, especially when you're suffering, he's always for you. He lives in you. He feels every bit of suffering that you feel. He is always for you. Um, if you see God as outside his creation looking in, it makes for a different kind of relationship than if you understand that God is inside his creation looking out with you. Okay. He, is, he is inside creation. Greater is he who lives in us than he who dwells in this world. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Um, 
God is inside us because of the incarnation. That's what incarnation means, right? It's a Latin meaning in flesh. Jesus was put in flesh. He took on flesh. And that really changes how you view, view suffering. Um, it should not surprise us uh, that that the body of Christ, us, right, would suffer in a sin-fallen world, right? Uh, now, you know, Sarah can't give, I, I don't have the chemical formula here, but I think that there are certain types of acid that dissolve metal, okay? Let's go with that. Let's pretend that I'm right, even if I'm not, that there are certain types of acid that dissolve metal. I think it would be maybe hydrofluoric acid dissolves metal. I don't know. Anyway, if I'm remembering breaking my Breaking Bad episodes correctly. Uh, so you would not be surprised, right, if you dipped metal into hydrofluoric acid and it dissolved. That wouldn't be surprising to you. It, it, it shouldn't be, right? If you know basic any kind of basic kind of chemistry, acid dissolves metal. Should it be surprising to you that the body of Christ suffers in a sin-fallen world? No. It shouldn't be surprising. It's just what it is. It's, it's the nature of the beast, and it is, it is who we are and what we are in this world. Uh, the, the, the good news is that while we do suffer, we suffer with Christ inside us, uh, knowing that Christ is always inside us and always mediating for us in every occasion. Uh, and we never have to fear that, that he has left us or abandoned us or moved on to better ground. All right, that's where we're going to stop for tonight. Hopefully next week we'll pick up on verse on chapter 19, which is a linchpin for the book. Uh, it's a great chapter. I encourage you to read uh, 19 and 20 uh, for next week. And until next week, uh, let's close with the benediction. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord that took his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. All right. As always, remember, if you have questions that I didn't get to tonight, uh, you can certainly email me at uh, pastor at trinityvp, as in Villa Park, dot com, and or you can text me at, at uh, my, uh, my cell phone uh, number, which I think I will not give out over Facebook. But all of you who are on tonight can look it up. Talk to you later and God's blessings to you.